legalizing drinking under 21, I don't think it's a good thing at all. But, Margaret, you haven't even got young teenagers in the home, have you? No, we haven't got any teenagers at all. Well, I, I just don't see why you'd be concerned with it. Oh, yes. I was just looking at the worm buds here, the spruce bud down here. No, as I recall it, some 50 years ago when I was sowing my wild oats, <laughs> it didn't have a curve around it like that one. Hey, Hallie, you've only had four glasses. Ah, four glasses is a quite a quite a number for me. I'm I'm an abstemious. Oh, <laughs> it's not every day of the year you get Bach beer, Harry. Yeah, honey. Yes. I'm back with some more twigs in my mouth. Wonderful. Well, I thought the police, the Toronto police, were looking for them. They haven't been able to find them yet. Mind you, they got 25 quarts of liquor. Oh, that's not bad, but they haven't got the band yet. At least you don't have to worry about traffic jams. That's one of the few advantages to starting your day at five o'clock. I've met only a couple of cars on the way down, and one of them is, as usual, a police cruiser. They always give me a long, hard look. Another thing that helps, that old CBC landmark is pretty hard to miss, even through half-closed eyes. I always find Mondays just a bit more desperate than other mornings. All the world's tragedy and disaster seem to have a habit of occurring on weekends. And that makes Monday's paper a pretty meager source when you're looking for humor in the news. I'm not quite sure of my own name at this stage or even what year it is. But I'm on the air in two hours, so I've got to sweat it out. I found in the years I've been doing the program, there's... No rhyme or reason to this elusive thing called inspiration. One morning, I can arrive fully rested, cheerful, raring to go, and I'll do a program which thoroughly depresses me. The very next day, tired, disgruntled, in a bad mood, I'll come up with two or three quick skits that I'm happy with. One thing I've learned, the stories that are funny in themselves usually aren't much help. It's the serious, the pretentious, the pompous element that I look for in a story. There's never time to enjoy the luxury of a script. Just dig out the meat of the story as it appears in the paper, and then after you spot the twist you want to give it, mentally map out the thread of the action. The dialogue, of course, will come later, ad lib, while I'm actually on the air. At least, that's my fond hope each morning. In about 20 minutes' time, my solitude will be rudely shattered. Producer Jack Budgel, engineer Ed Scott, and sound effects engineer John Sliz will all land in. And I've got to have a firm enough idea about each skit to be able to brief them on what they need to know in order to put it on the air. I must admit it's nice to see a human being after a long, lonely session in that deserted studio, but at the same time, that trio of footsteps also means that time has almost run out. Half an hour after they get here, the show starts. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ed. Jack. I've got an awful lot. Got an awful lot. But the main headline, I think, is going to be the talk of the day. They're using uh, gas. Americans are supplying the South Vietnamese with gas against the Viet Cong. And I guess we'll do something. Uh, I have thought of the idea of a. a you know, this, this argument always, the world is suddenly getting up in arms now. The reports are starting to come in from England and all over the world condemning the use of gas. And I always, you know, feel, what, what is the difference whether killed by gas or a napalm bomb? But one apparently is playing the game, the other isn't so... And one battle as well? Well, battle sort of a, well, give me a jungle, I don't know, a jungle birds or something. Yeah. Uh, there won't be too much of a babble because on mic we'll just have the major and a, a lieutenant or something. This will be on filter. 
No, no, he'll they'll probably be a walkie-talkie, yeah. but we're hearing them live. We won't be hearing them the way the pilots in the helicopter. With respect to this with him. Helicopters coming in, a crump of the bombs landing. Then the ah, 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 the automatic weapons, and uh, I don't know what else. We'll throw flamethrowers and everything. On a full-scale war. Sort of, yeah. I think the irony, the irony of the news story will probably come across that way. Um, hmm. That is the headline story in the paper this morning. The other one, I, I don't know. No, the only thing I think we can go with, uh, I haven't quite decided how we'll treat it yet, but the, an interesting story about uh, Robert Kennedy is going to climb a mountain in the Yukon. It's been named after his brother, the late president, and he wants to be the first man to climb it. And he's going up with, I mean, here, here we have a politician, what, Senator Robert Kennedy, climbing a mountain, even though he is going up with some professional climbers. Lovely. There's nothing much with the story itself I can do. I have to get that analogy technique because, do you remember last year we did a story... They've been mooting this about from time to time that they're going to name a, a peak in the Rockies after John Diefenbaker. We had it a year ago. Oh, yeah. Thing is, if we can get some fun with him climbing the mountain, then they're going to name after him. Um, as far as sound goes, John, I guess there's not much you can give me except wind. a mournful wind, yeah. <coughs> maybe a crow or something out in the far Actually, distant space. Away. You have to take it off. Oh, there. Um, <sighs> we'll have this. See this? Well. Party? Not too many. There's a, there are press men up there. We'll, we'll jump ahead to the day when Diefenbaker is actually climbing this mountain. Uh, there press, there'll be a babble of press voices. The thing is, it's being sponsored. This Kennedy one is being sponsored by the National Geographic Society and the Boston Museum of Science. So we'll have ours, the Diefenbaker episode, sponsored by the uh, Canadian Geographic Society and the Liberal Party. And the question right away is, what are the Liberals doing? Anyway? I think we're going to have to pre-record because while he is saying this. We've got to suggest the fact that Diefenbaker has already done this. This will be pre-recorded. Uh, I want to pre-record on, if you give me an echo effect, let's see, it's one of the guys up there, one of the mountain climbers, bellowing down the mountain, Mr. Diefenbaker, what did you do that for? Can you hear me? Mr. And he's yelling. This will, what a nice big echo effect. In other words, he's gone. Uh, while while uh, Pearson is uh, grandiloquently speaking of uh, the aims they have for Mr. Diefenbaker, he'll be turning the odd somersaults, and this will go on at the same time. I'll, that's why I'll have to pre-record it. All you have to do now is guess, guess the punchline. Yeah, yeah, it'll come as a merry ha-ha and surprise you all. <laughs> okay, ha -ha, those yeah. are the three, anyway. Okay, we'll go with fine, them I'll go pick them up. Fine. In a matter of minutes, we'll be going live to the Maritimes. <laughs> and no matter how many years you've been at this business, it's along about here that the stomach walls start to constrict just a tiny bit. The last-minute technical preparations always baffle me. There seem to be a thousand rituals to be performed, checking cables, outlets, pots, lining up with master control, whatever that means. One thing I do understand, without a sound effects man who knows his library and can do the 110 flat, I'm in real trouble. Quite often at this stage, I'll get a change of thought, a, a different way of handling a skit. But invariably, just when I'm losing myself in the new idea, sadistic old Alan McPhee glides in a few feet away to remind me, almost gleefully, that I'm being brilliant a bit too late. Five seconds. It's the Max Ferguson Show. <laughs> Monday, March the 22nd, and the CBC Radio Network proudly presents a light look at the news as seen by Max Ferguson. And now, here's Max. Thank you, Alan McPhee, and good morning, Canada, for Monday, March the 22nd. We noticed a little hesitation there, Alan, a little mental lapse on the date this morning. I noticed that... Uh, on the uh, NHL hockey, you never forget what night it is in Canada, but uh, on our little program, you've almost forgot our date. But that 10-to-1 be... score, Max, is a little upsetting. Yes, yeah, but I was just thinking, would it ever happen on, on that program? You say, once again, from coast to coast, it's hockey night again. <laughs> See, you, you make your slips on our little program. And now here's hockey. Yeah. <laughs> However, you have managed to launch our Monday program. Thank you, Ellen. We have our looks at the news, as usual, this morning. 
And, as usual, we have our opening music. It's 8.35 in the Maritimes now, and they're hearing the program as it happens. Tapes already rolling in the recording room will bring the show to the rest of the country as their clocks hit the same hour. I like the idea of being heard first down east. That's where it all began 18 years ago, when I inflicted a ornery old cuss named Rawhide on them. It was their wonderful reception of him and his cohorts that really launched my career. I like the pace of life down there, where they take the time to enjoy what they have, where they welcome progress, but can still cherish history. I've spent 18 summers by the Atlantic, and I've never failed to come back with a fresh perspective on the world around me. That brings us to our first news story of the morning for Tuesday, March 23rd, and we're dealing with a headline story this morning, a story that's going to cause a lot of controversy. Here it is. United States uses war gas against Viet Cong, first time since 1914 conflict. From Saigon comes the news that non-lethal gases, some of which induce uh, extreme nausea and vomiting, have been used against the Viet Cong guerrillas in South Vietnam. U.S. military authorities confirmed this yesterday. In Washington, officials were obviously sensitive to the propaganda problems posed by the disclosure that gas was being used. They insisted that the gas... Uh, is, the use of gas is not contrary to international law, uh, but the administration in Washington did not reveal the chemical characteristics of the gases. Already world protest is beginning to come in from the communist countries, first of all, but also from um, Britain, where uh, a group of labor MPs, uh, labor MPs have sent a strongly worded protest to Washington. And in the States itself, Senator Wayne Morris, uh, uh, Wayne Morris has uh, said that this is not only unethical, but it's also illegal. And the arguments have started. I always think these arguments against the use of poison gas are, if not a downright hip hypocritical, they're at least specious. It boils down to the question of which is the uh, best way of killing a human being. But uh, anyway, the gas is being used, and uh, until they resolve the problem, uh, it will go on, I suppose. I wonder what the reaction of the U.S. commanders in the field would be to the use of this poison gas against the Viet Cong. Well, we got them in there, boxed in as neat as you please, eh, hey, uh, Major? Yeah. Yeah, we got about eight companies in the jungle around that clearing. And look at those Viet Cong guys. About 150 of them there huddled together in the clearing, sitting ducks. You been on the field telephone? Yeah, all the helicopters are coming in. Boy, when we drop those gases on them, they're going to really have a fit, aren't they? Well, I don't know about that. I've, uh, I've ordered the helicopters not to drop any of the gases. Major, you kidding? It's been authorized by Washington. I know, but... Comes a time when every individual commander has to make his own decision and look into his heart and... Well, I don't know. I, uh... I just told these helicopter pilots that I, I want, uh, no gas drop on these fellas. Gee, Major, I, I don't want to call you soft, but you sure are humanitarian. Well, no time for accolades right now. Uh, give me the walkie-talkie, will you? Yeah, here you are, Major. Hello. Hello, attention. Helicopter pilots. Helicopter pilots. This is Major Forbes. I want to reconfirm my earlier order that under no conditions will gas be dropped on this pocket of Viet Cong we've got cornered here. I see you're just coming in low level now, fellas. I can spot you coming in from the southwest. Under no circumstances use gas on these Viet Cong. Major, if we had more humanitarians like you... Here, shut up just a second. All right, fellas, you're just about over the target area. Uh, let those napalm bombs go at will. I don't know, Major... If we, if we had more humanitarians like you in the... Uh, just a second, will you, please? I, uh, I can remember as a kid uh, being sick. And uh, I'll never forget, it's a frightening experience for a kid to be sick, and it's, it's always stayed with me. And I don't know, if we dropped gases on those fellas out there, and I had to stand here and watch them being sick, uh, it's, it's more than I could take. Well, I just want to say once again, if we had more humanitarians... Uh, just a second, will you be quiet? All right, you men... You men here in the jungle, you've got a clear field across that opening there, a clearing. I'll just try and get a crossfire going, all right? Let those automatic weapons go. Major, I just want to say once again, if we had more humanitarians... Now, oh, shut up just a second, will you? Gang, with those flamethrowers, uh, try and... I know there's an inferno out there, but uh, 
Try and burn the ground as, and not the guys. Boy, oh, you're a real humanitarian, Major. If we had more fellows like you, I think... Every time I finish a skit, I'm amazed that the gang somehow knew where I was going. Because half the time, I didn't know myself. Although there's one rule that uh, we sort of all, all follow, uh, the three of us that do the show, is uh, when in doubt, open the door. Another thing I think that's very important is that everyone can do everyone else's job. I'm referring now to the sound man, could do my job. I have a little difficulty doing his, but I can do it. The producer can do my job. He was a technician before he was a producer. And uh, I think he can also do sound. But the thing is this, we know the problems that exist on this side of the glass because we've worked on both sides. Initial ideas are Max's. Uh, the best approach a producer can take is to be uh, completely in tune. And this only comes with experience, uh, in tune with the way Max likes to handle various subjects and uh, then complement uh, his ideas as best you can by working with the sound man and the uh, technician. It's sort of a, ch a sound man's challenge. Just uh, get in the morning, you really don't know what, uh, what to expect. Robert Kennedy plans to start a scent of Yukon Mountain today. This is an incredible story. Senator Robert Kennedy left last night for the Yukon, where he will attempt to be the first man to reach the top of a 13,900-foot mountain named after his brother, John F. Kennedy. Weather permitting, Robert Kennedy hopes to make his ascent this afternoon. Now, we had a story not long ago saying that they may be naming a mountain in the Canadian Rockies after John Diefenbaker. I don't know whether this will come to pass or not, but if it does, Rather than present a little scroll to him in his office in Ottawa, wouldn't it be colorful to take a leaf from the Book of the Americans and have John Diefenbaker scale the mountain uh, which is being named after him? I think it would be wonderfully uh, colorful. It would enable us to keep abreast of the uh, way things are done in the United States. And, of course, the CBC would be there covering the whole thing for its national radio system. On a cattle of Marvel Bell Bell of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation... We are standing just at the very summit now of Mount John Diefenbaker. Just about three minutes ago, Mr. Diefenbaker made the last few tired steps in his ascent. It has taken him almost a week, but very gamely and courageously, he has become the first man in the world to climb Mount John Diefenbaker, which has been named after him. The project has been sponsored by the Canadian Geographic Society and the Liberal Party. Uh, we haven't yet been able to ascertain why the Liberal Party would be a joint sponsor of this mountain climbing expedition. We hope to uh, find this out in just a moment because I see Mr. Diefenbaker is over here. There are quite a few Liberals here today. I think it's very uh, indicative of the fair play of uh, politics in this country that so many uh, of the Liberals would be here to watch uh, John Diefenbaker uh, climbed this mountain. Uh, I'm going to ask briefly the uh, the uh, gentleman here, representing the Canadian Geographic Society, Mr. Johnson. Sir, could you? Oh, uh, yes, what is it? Uh, we want to get up there and give him, uh, John a hand with these mountain boots, get them off. He's a pretty tired uh, leader of the opposition right now, I'll tell you. Uh, yes, I won't keep you very long, sir. I just wondering, what was the purpose of this whole thing? Well, briefly, uh, what the Canadian Geographic Society had in mind was to just uh, match the Americans. Uh, a little while ago, Robert Kennedy climbed the mountain. It was named after him. And uh, when we heard they're naming a mountain after John Diefenbaker, we thought, what a wonderful chance for Canada to get right in the forefront there and uh, and uh, match the Americans step for step. I see. How is Mr. Diefenbaker feeling? Well, he's a, as I say, he's a pretty tired man. He's been at this a week now. But he's, uh, he's finally made the top there. There in the valley of the oh, 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 green... Ah, oh, Mr. Diefenbaker, no. Get those guys out of there. No commercials. Get out of there, you fellas. No TV commercials. We don't want to prostitute this whole thing. It's a, it's a, it's a political and a scientific... Uh, yeah, get them out of there. Uh, no more commercials, Mr. Dingbeger. Look, I, I better go over there coaching those commercial guys over there. They have them cigarettes in his mouth and, and all kinds of things there if I don't watch them. Well, thank you very much, sir. Not at all. John, I'll give you a hand with those boots. No, we're just trying to... Mr. Pearson, could you come over here? Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> yes, sir. This is a glorious occasion for both liberals and conservatives and indeed all of Canada. 
Yes, indeed it is, sir. A wonderful triumph for Mr. Baker to have climbed this mountain. I was just wanting to ask you, sir, we have not have it, had it explained to us yet uh, the interest that the Liberal Party has in all this. You are co-sponsor. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, we are the co-sponsors of this. Why, why would this be so? Well, whereas the National Geographic Society, or rather the Canadian Geographic Society, is interested in having Mr. Baker scale this mountain in order that we may duplicate the feat of Robert Kennedy some months ago, and the Liberal Party saw in this a wonderful opportunity to enable Canada to catch up not only, not only with the United States, but indeed with Russia. Uh, what do you mean by this, uh, Mr. Person? Well, once, once Mr. Diefenbaker's at the top here, I think the most important part is yet to follow. We have asked Mr. Diefenbaker, at least I, I haven't mentioned it to him yet, I'm going to. Uh, I've, I've mentioned briefly that we want him to do this for us, but he hasn't given us his final decision. Uh, do, do what, Mr. Person? <clears throat> we thought that once... Excuse me, just... What, what is it, uh, Mr. Diefenbaker? Oh, um... Well, Lester, I've been thinking over this suggestion. I'm, I'm pretty tired after that climb. You're not going to back out now. Well, uh, are you sure it's all right? I mean, have, have you got your facts straight? I, I, I guess I'm positive. And all the eyes of all Canada are on you now. Well, I, I don't know. I don't like the sounds of it. <clears throat> School children yet unborn will one day read in their history books of this incredible performance of you, John Diefenbaker, which enabled Canada to step into the forefront, not only with the United States, but indeed with Russia. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you put it that way, I'll, I'll give it a darn good try. Mm -hmm. I thank you very much. Ah, it's a real sport. Uh, Mr. Pearson, we still haven't uh, ascertained yet. What, what is it the Liberal Party's asking him to do? <clears throat> The Liberal Party has asked Mr. Diefenbaker, and I'm sure we will get his cooperation, to step from the top of the mountain and walk perhaps, oh, 16 feet or so out into space. Perhaps stand on his head out there or do a somersault or some such thing. Uh, what, at 15,000 feet? Yes, we, we feel that this is possible. What did you do that for? Uh, Mr. We, we think that, Mr. Say something. Mr. Pearson, I, it's only 15,000 feet. Weightlessness doesn't set in at about 20 miles. Are you sure? Yes, yes, there's no... We're, he's still under the effect of gravity. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I didn't realize. Well, perhaps we should have checked a little more carefully. reads, Refusing Entry to Sibley Upheld. This is the Winnipeg uh, immigration case where a Minnesota professor, Mulford Q. Sibley, that's his real name, was refused entrance to Canada by immigration authorities. Uh, he was coming to give a lecture to the uh, voice of women out there, and he's going to have to try again. They won't let him in. He's going to have to try again. I think a lot of Canadians will have their fingers crossed and hope that uh, he has better luck at the immigration uh, check-in point at Winnipeg next time he arrives. Uh, excuse me. What? Would you just wait your turn? Uh, you haven't any liquor. No, I haven't any liquor, no. Oh, uh, okay. Pat, is, is it my turn? Yeah, would you just uh, fin finish with this guy here? <laughs> no liquor, okay. Um, you're not a pacifist, are you? A pacifist? Are you kidding? I've been screaming from the top of the rooftops in the United States. We should shoot them all, club them in the street, take their property, lock them all up, and do away with them once and for all. That's what I've been screaming. Pass of us all. All right, all right, fine. Okay, that seems to be an order, Mr. Rockwell. Well, it's about time. Let's go in there. Uh, sir, I'm, 
Oh, it's you. Well, look, uh, Mr. Sibley, we've been all through this thing again. Honest to Pete, I'd like to let you into Canada, but the trouble is, you're a pacifist, and on and on. That's about it, I guess, Alan. Alan will be back with his cheery openings and closings, and may the good Lord take a liking to you. What I wanted to say was something fresh and original, such as we'll all be in our places with sunshiny faces. Come tomorrow morning, we hope you will be in your place out there in Radio Land with a sunshiny face. Alan, get get me out of this, will you please? Theme. <laughs> The Max Ferguson Show is a CBC Radio Network feature presentation weekday mornings at this same time. We invite you to be with us again tomorrow. This is the CBC Radio Network. That's what this is. Don't push your luck, Alan. Well... Ontario and Quebec are the next to get the show. And they tell me that car radios in the big cities bring it to a considerable slice of the audience. In spite of the agony involved, I always tune in myself on the way home. It's the first real chance I've had to hear the show. Was it good, bad, or indifferent? I'm still too close to it to tell for sure. But in a day or two, as the mail drifts in, I'll get the verdict from all across the country. It may come from an advertising executive, a, a bus driver, a doctor, or a politician. It may come from a farmer, a noil man, or a housewife out in the prairies. Perhaps from a logger, a nurse, a professor on the West Coast, or a storekeeper in the Yukon. A little later, the servicemen in Europe and their families let me know what they think. They may praise or criticize, but they always do it with fairness. There are thousands of them, and they've taught me one thing. Contrary to popular belief, somewhere along the line, Canadians have learned to laugh at themselves. Thank you.